So, um, but let's enter into a time of worship this evening before we get started into the work. Mm-hmm. 
chicken nuggets. Yeah. That's what I want to start off talking to you tonight about is chicken nuggets. I want, wherever you're watching this from, I want you to um, put in the comments, let us know, where's your favorite chicken nuggets from? So mine kind of fluctuate back and forth, but recently what I've really been enjoying has been McDonald's chicken nuggets. They've got to be fresh, right out of the fryer, straight into the box, straight into my mouth. And recently, they had a sauce um, that was new to them. It was the Cajun sauce. And it was one of the best sauces I've ever tasted. And that one sauce made me keep going back over and over and over to get those fresh, hot chicken nuggets with the Cajun sauce. Well, recently, the last two times I've went, I found out that was just a limited time only, and they don't have it anymore. So I've had to go back to what used to be my favorite sauce, and it's still one of my favorite all-time sauces, the sweet and sour. The sweet and sour sauce from McDonald's is an absolute game changer. I'm not much of a french fry person, but you put french fries in the sweet and sour sauce and something magical happens. You put those fresh, hot chicken nuggets in the sweet and sour sauce and it's just an explosion of flavor. It's the absolute best. But what's interesting about sweet and sour dipping sauce is it, it, it marries two things that on the surface don't seem to be compatible. Sweet and sour how do those two things go together? That, that, that's a hard question to answer, but I know this. When I dip my nuggets and my fries in this, it works. There's something about it that works. They go together to make a good sauce. Now, what I want to talk to you about tonight is that God also has what some would consider a sweet and a sour side. That when we look at the, the sweet side, the grace and the mercy of God, we like that. And then, then there's the sour side that, that, that we don't always like, the judgment, his righteousness, the way that he, um, he, he's not, he, he punishes sin and, and, and he always does what's right even when it hurts. And, and it's these two sides of his, his character where he's holy, but he's loving, and, and it seems to me like it's like a sweet and sour sauce. They don't seem to go together, but when they come together, it makes a good and a perfect God. Because we have to have his justice. We have to have his righteousness. We also have to have that love and that mercy and that compassion, and they balance each other out, and it just works. And that's what I want to talk to you about this evening, is how in the, the Old Testament prophet um, Joel, in his writings, we see another example of this God who, as John says in John 1, 14, is full of grace and full of truth. So we are in a series here on Wednesday nights at Southridge Church called Not So Minor Prophets, where we're going to be looking at some of the smaller prophetic books in the Old Testament. And tonight I have the book of Joel. What we want to see in um, these books as we look is who wrote them, why were they were written, what do they mean to the original audience, and what do they mean to us? Now, as a point of clarification that I think gets overlooked a lot in, in the church and in our teaching um, a lot is the role of the prophet. A lot of times we look at books like Joel and Hosea and these other books that we'll be studying over the next coming weeks, and we think... Um, when we think prophet, we think someone that tells me what is going to come to pass. What's going to happen in the future? And that's what we specifically mean when we say prophet. But that's not actually the role of the prophet. The role of the prophets um, to Israel and to the nations of Judah was not just to say what was coming in the future, although that happened from time to time. The majority of the time, the prophet was the person that came and spoke truth to power. The people that were in charge, the prophet was the one that would show up and say, listen, if you don't change your ways, this is what will happen. There will be consequences. You will be judged. God will punish you. There will be bad things that may come if you do not repent and change. That was the role of prophet, was to speak truth to power and to call people to repent. Repent. 
But then from time to time, those same folks would have these oracles or these visions of things that were to come. But I want to make sure that we're clear on the role of prophet. The role of the prophet was normally to speak truth to power and not play the role of some fortune teller of things that were going to come in the future. That was a small portion of what it meant to be a prophet. Um, so when we get to the, the book of Joel, we're going to see that Joel actually plays um, all of those roles, where he speaks truth to power, he calls people to repent, but he actually is one of the, the prophetic writers that did have a vision of something that was coming in the future. So Joel is written by the prophet Joel, and his name means Yahweh is God. He was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now the hard thing about Joel is that there's not consensus about when it should be dated. There is actually multiple interpretations. There's an early interpretation that, that perhaps it happened before um, the Babylonian exile. Then there is another view that says it happened afterwards. I would be of the opinion that it was probably in the post-exilic um, time because it, it shows the temple walls being up and the temple being back in place, which is something that happened around the time of Ezra and Nehemiah when they came back and performed their task to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple and all that. I, I would be of the mind that, that, that it makes sense, as well as the fact that it doesn't mention any, any kings by name. It sounds like it would be a later date would make sense to me. But I believe that when it's best when there's no consensus, that we go to the things that are super clear in the text to make sense of what God can be saying to us today. In all biblical writings, we have to understand that they were written originally for an audience that was not us, but yet they still carry meaning for us today. And so the, the text, first and foremost, has to be written to that original audience, and then from there we find out what it means for us. So, a quick overview of the book. In chapter 1, Joel talks about this plague of locusts that has overtaken Jerusalem and has pretty much eaten away all the food, and there's all these calamities that are coming as the result. And, and in chapter 1, this plague of the locusts is meant to, to make us think of what happened um, when the Israelites were in Egypt. When the Israelites were in Egypt and they were enslaved, God sent plagues against Egypt to, to show them who the true God is. And one of those plagues was the plague of locusts. And so our mind is supposed to go back to that story, and we're supposed to see a connection between what happened in Egypt and what is getting ready to happen here. And in chapter 2, we see a vision of a future event that's going to happen, and then chapter 3 kind of wraps it all up. Now, one of the unique things about Joel compared to other prophetic writers is Joel does not give one specific sin of the people of Judah, whereas other um, prophetic writers will say it's because you're not taking care of the poor, it's because you're neglecting your duties, it's because you're not tithing, whatever it is. Um, he doesn't do that. It's left very general. And, and, and I would say that I actually kind of appreciate that because um, what we see as Joel calls the people to repent is that it, it really doesn't matter what the specific sin is, the response to the sin needs to be the same no matter what it is. So no matter whether it was exploiting the poor or whatever the sin was, it doesn't matter, um, the call to repentance is the same. And that's what we see in Joel chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. It says, Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you, men, you who minister before the altar. So he's speaking to the priest, speaking truth to power. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, which was a sign of mourning for what they had done, you who minister before my God, so once again, to the priest, for the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. He's saying you need to do something because you have sinned. Summon the elders in, in who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and to cry out to the Lord. So once again, we see Joel speaking truth to power by calling out not just the, the priest, but also the elders of the people. And then verse 15 says, Alas, for that, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. So, so Joel, in the midst of this calamity that's happening with the locusts, 
He says, the reason this is happening is because you have not repented. And if you want God to come back and to bless your people, to get back into right relationship with him, you need to repent. True repentance doesn't just say sorry, but is actually sorry enough to change. Actually sorry enough to change. True repentance, as we see in this passage, is accompanied by mourning and sorrow. That's the, the sackcloth and ashes and declare a fast because you're sorrow of, sorrowful for what you have done. It, it, we're not just sorry for getting caught or the fact that we have to face consequences, which in this case was the locust. We're not sorry just for those things. But, but because the peop, as the people of God... As we develop in our relationship with God, we, we should come to despise our sin and sin in general as much as God despises sin as well, which means that when we sin, when we're off track in our lives, it should bring about a godly sorrow in our life that causes us to repent, to turn away, to go a different direction. I, I, I just think about, and maybe you'll think about some times where you just got it wrong. And I think about times that I got it wrong in my life and I've sinned. The, the weight and the heaviness of that sin sometimes feels enough to crush me. It, I, I remember on the day of the worst mistake of my life that there felt like, it, it felt like there was an elephant sitting on my chest because I knew I had done wrong. I, I can never shake the feelings that, that when, I, when I yell at my kids or, I, or I, I say something to someone in a conversation that maybe I wish that I hadn't said, I, I walk away from that with this sense of sadness in my heart because I know, once again, I fell short and I'm sorrowful for the fact that I behaved in that manner. It, it, it is somewhat of a sense of shame, but, but not the unhealthy type of shame that, that makes me withdraw and run away from God and run away from people, but it's a, a healthy shame that draws me to repentance and draws me back to God. It, it's a shame that says, I'm not okay with what I just did. So when it comes to the sin in your life, true repentance looks like you not being okay with what just happened. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but it means that I'm going to do my best to turn from it and to walk away. And at the very least, I'm going to be sorrowful for the fact that my flesh still cries out and causes me to sin. Repentance doesn't just settle stuff with God either. It also settles stuff with the people that we've wronged. That, that looks like a lot of times for me, having to go back to someone and say, hey, you know what, what I said, I, I was so, I, I'm sorry for that. That was inappropriate. I shouldn't have treated you like that. I shouldn't have said that. That's the other side of repentance. Now, repentance is clearly a, uh, a big theme in the book of Joel, but the main theme in the book of Joel is what he hits on in verse 15. He says, alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come like destruction from the Almighty. So the main theme that we see in the book of Joel is actually this theme of the day of the Lord. It's used five times, that, that phrase is used five times in Joel, and it's only used 19 times in all of the Old Testament, so 14 times elsewhere, five times in the book of Joel. And the day of the Lord speaks to this coming judgment that's going to happen. Um, in each case, when the day of the Lord is mentioned in the, the book of Joel, the Lord either brings judgment or he brings deliverance and blessing. Both of these themes at, are present also in the Exodus story. Remember, the locusts in chapter 1 are meant to draw our minds back to Egypt where the Israelites were enslaved and God set them free, brought deliverance through his power, including the plague of locusts. But we also, in that story, see God's judgment upon the people of Egypt for their wrongdoing as well. So when Joel speaks of the day of the Lord, he, he speaks of deliverance and he speaks of judgment simultaneously. This is that dual nature. That is, this is the sweet and sour sauce of God's character. That, that wherever God goes... There is judgment, there is justice, there is righteousness, 
but there is also love and compassion and mercy. He is full of grace and truth. See, the fullest expression of the character of God is when truth is in perfect balance with grace, where that tension is managed and not um, shifted to one side or the other. So, so in chapter 1, the people of Judah are warned of this coming day of judgment, and he says, repent, repent, perhaps you can save this off. Perhaps if you repent, you won't have to experience this horrible judgment that is coming. And that's why true repentance is so important, because no matter whether we're talking about the day of the Lord or anything else, sin always has a gotcha. Sin always comes with consequences. When we don't live as God wants us to live, not, and I'm not just saying that God punishes and, and, and that's the consequences of sin, because we know that's part of it, but there's also just um, you, you sow something bad, you're going to reap something bad. Like A lot of times we do something wrong, we end up paying the consequences. So, so in chapter 1, he says, repent because the day of the Lord is coming. But when? When? The, the question for me as I'm reading that, I go, so when is the day of the Lord coming? And, and so move with me to, to Joel chapter 2. This is what it says in verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It's close at hand. A, it, 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 it's a day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. So now we begin to see this day of the Lord in a future sense. We have a a, a sense of what it may look like, of what it might entail. And, And Joel says it involves an army. That's going to be so vast it can be likened to the locust of chapter 1. This is why we should repent. Now, many will look at the prophetic nature of what Joel is saying here and blow straight to the conclusion that Joel is now speaking about the end of the world or the end times or what's going to happen at the end of everything here, it, there's a lot that will just blow right to that conclusion that Joel, when we talk about the day of the Lord, that that is what he's talking about. He's talking about Armageddon. He's talking about everything at the end. He's talking about Revelation. And I can certainly understand where people might get that from. The day of the Lord, that's when Jesus comes back and, and, and he's going to judge the, the wicked and there's going to be a mighty army. And there's, I can see where that comes from. But remember... In, in, in all of biblical text, the original text has to mean something to the original audience first and foremost. So to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense that, that, that God would send a prophetic vision to Joel about something that's going to happen far off. Because here we said about 2,600 years after the life of Joel, and, and we don't see any sort of um, day of the Lord or whatnot. And, and remember, he says... The day of the Lord is coming, it is close at hand. It's close at hand. So, so my question would be, why, why would God send a message of warning to the people of Israel, to the, to the nation of Judah at this time, for something that is still so far off? 2,600 years at the very least, and here we stand with nothing like that happening in our current culture either. So so my question becomes, perhaps that's not what Joel meant by the day of the Lord. Perhaps he means something else. Is there something else that would make sense in this context? Another clue to the timing of the event of the day of the Lord, we actually find in the New Testament. Um, In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, here's what he says. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom are 
the Lord calls. That's from the second chapter of Joel. That's after this first um, mention of the day of the Lord and this vast army coming. He says that he's going to pour out his spirit on all people. And this is all going to be connected to the day of the Lord. Now, we actually see this passage, Joel 2, 28 to 32, repeated in the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, and that's what Joel's talking about, I will pour out my spirit on all people, he is speaking of the day of Pentecost. When the early church believers in the first century were filled with the spirit, and God's spirit came to dwell within believers, that's what he's talking about. And Peter uses this passage from Joel. But listen to what Peter says. There's a little change from the original text in Joel 2 to what Peter says. Here's what Peter says in verse, uh, chapter 2 of Acts, verse 17. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now, if you go back to Joel 2, you see, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Peter changes this, and Luke records it, to where it says, in the last days. In the last days. Wait, well, wait a second. When Peter preached this sermon on the day of Pentecost, that was practically 2,000 years ago. But he says that this is going to happen. The day of the Lord is going to happen in the last days. W what could he possibly mean by the last days? I it's my opinion the way that I read the text and the way that I look at, at God's revelation to us and, and, and honestly just looking at historical events and things, it's my opinion that Peter believes that Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit that was prophesied in Joel chapter 2, is ushering in the last days before the day of the Lord that Joel had prophesied. Pentecost happens 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. The day of the Lord, as it's spoken about over and over in Joel, brings judgment and deliverance. What is this day of the Lord that Joel, some 2,700 years ago, prophesied and that Peter references in the first century? What is this possible day of the Lord? I would say that it makes sense to me historically and biblically that when, when Peter speaks of the last days, he is speaking of the last days of the temple system in Jerusalem, which if you're very familiar with history, and I know that this is not something that is widely taught, but it's something that the church really should grasp a hold of, is that in AD 70, Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem was completely destroyed by the Romans. And with it, we see the final blow to the old covenant and the old temple way of worshiping God and Yahweh being once and for all replaced by the new covenant of grace ushered in by Jesus Christ himself. And so the day of the Lord was Jesus coming in judgment against Jerusalem as was prophesied in Joel chapter 2 to put an end to the old covenant and usher once and for all in the new covenant that was sealed with the blood of Jesus. As you read that prophecy in Joel chapter 2, the language of wonders in the heavens and darkness and any cosmic imagery in this culture and in this time, these are all signs of the destruction of a nation or a city. That, that's what's seen in these pictures. These are not... Um, literal statements that the, the, that the sky is going to turn dark or anything like that. These are all ways of saying Jesus is coming in destruction against a city, and the city happens to be Jerusalem. And so, uh, verse 32. Verse 32, um, what's going to happen when Jesus comes in judgment against Jerusalem? And we see that happen in the years leading up to AD 70, and then it all culminates in AD 70. What happens? In, in verse 32, it says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. 
But wait a second, the day of the Lord is bringing judgment, but remember the day of the Lord also brings deliverance. The same way God delivered the Israelites from Egypt, God also protected his people, the Israelites. So Egypt experienced judgment, the Israelites experienced deliverance. In the midst of the judgment, there was still mercy. That's the sweet and sour sauce. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you would take the premise that the day of the Lord, spoken about in Joel 2, is this destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Here's the interesting thing. As judgment comes upon one group of people, the, uh, the, the Jews in Jerusalem, deliverance actually happened for another group of people. Interesting to note by multiple historians, the Jerusalem church, the first century church that met in Jerusalem, the, the first century Christians, when the destruction happened of the temple and everything going on in Jerusalem where people were just being slaughtered by the thousands, the Christian church is, is noted in history to have fled to an area of Pella. In fact, historian Eusebius says, furthermore, the members of the Jerusalem church, by means of an oracle given by revelation, to acceptable persons there, meaning someone got word about what was going on, were ordered to leave the city before the war began and settled in an area of Perea called Pella. A a another theologian, John Gill, writes, it is remarked by several interpreters and with Josephus, who was a Jewish historian that worked closely with the Romans to, to, to write all that took place during the siege of Jerusalem and everything. He takes note, Josephus takes note with surprise that Cestius Gallus, who was one of the uh, Roman commanders, having advanced with his army to Jerusalem and besieged it, on a sudden and without any cause, raised the siege and withdrew his army when the city might have easily been taken. Here's what Josephus was writing. He said, Cestius Gallus, he could have overtaken the whole city. But for some reason, unbeknownst to anyone, he stopped the siege and removed his army. They just, they just took off. They didn't finish the job in that moment. By which means, John Gill goes on, by which means a signal was made and an opportunity given to the Christians to make their escape, which they accordingly did and went over to Jordan, as Eusebius says, to a place called Pella, so that then when Titus came a few months after, there was not a single Christian in the city. In fact, Multiple historians will attest to the fact that when Jerusalem was experiencing the judgment of God, not one single first century Christian is said to have been killed in that siege as the church had moved to Pella. So we see, once again, the day of the Lord bringing judgment, but also deliverance. Now, as we go on, chapter 3 ends with a word about how the other sinful nations will ultimately be judged the same as Egypt was judged, the same as Israel had been judged, but ultimately the people of God will experience the blessing of God through the Spirit now and forever. Why? Because remember, Joel 2, I will pour out my Spirit. And the fulfillment of that happened in Acts chapter 2. Now the people of God are fulfilled and endowed with the Spirit of God both now and forever. And perhaps... This is all brand new information for you, right? Per perhaps what happened in Jerusalem, Jerusalem through the 60 ADs and ultimately culminating in 70 AD is new to you. Or, or perhaps you prefer to look at the prophetic statements of Joel and say, no, he's talking about the end of the world, a different day of the Lord. Per perhaps that's why, or perhaps you believe there's just a better explanation for the text than that. For me, you can interpret this prophecy however you like because i think the key to the book of joel doesn't lie necessarily in how we interpret the history or what we believe the day of the lord ultimately means i believe the message is this god is merciful in fact in chapter 2 it says this rend your heart and not your garments return to the lord your god for he is gracious and compassionate he's slow to anger and abounding in love and he relents from sending calamity the message of joel 
is that for the truly repentant, you don't have to worry about whatever your interpretation of the day of the Lord is. For those who are filled with the Spirit of God, you don't have to worry about that. Because God is merciful, and and a reminder of what he says in chapter 2, verse 32, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So just like God saved physically the first century church as they escaped to Pella, God can save you also from your sins. But you have to repent. You have to turn from your sins. You have to have a godly sorrow about your sin. You have to turn from it. You can't just say you're sorry. You actually have to be sorry. I love this picture of the mercy of God. But we know that a merciful God is also a God of justice and judgment because if God let people get away with the wrongdoings, he wouldn't really be loving and merciful. And that's the beautiful, sweet and sour nature of the character of God. And it doesn't seem like they go together, but they do and it makes a perfect loving, and just character for the one true God. So maybe tonight, um, that's exactly what you need to do is repent. As you look at God and at your life, maybe, you, may, maybe you've been taking advantage of God, and you've been really into the loving side of it, but now you're realizing his justice side that calls you to repent. Or, or, or maybe you're of the mindset that God is all justice and always just kind of hammering down on you, and I hope tonight you see the loving side, that he is crazy about you, that he loves you. But I pray whether you're a follower of Jesus and you've been struggling with sin, or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, I pray that our response tonight would all be the same, that we would repent, that we would turn from our sin, that we would trust Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for always loving us. Thank you for having this beautifully rich character that sometimes is hard for us to understand how all the pieces go together. And yet we see these little tiny parts in your word that help us make sense of who you really are. I'm thankful for the book of Joel and what it can teach us. And though though some of what we talked about tonight may be a little um, historical and a little heavy and a little um, maybe just too much for us to comprehend in such a short setting, I pray that the message of your grace and your justice would be what we really take away tonight. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.